The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic and Typebond. Wood. Such a simple thing, but is it really? I mean, the more I work with wood, the more I realize I don't know that much about it. You know, just trying to predict what wood will do after it's worked, after it's milled, or spotting things in a rough board to predict what it's going to do after I actually work it down to the size that I need. This is stuff that comes with experience, and you could make a lot of mistakes along the way, and I certainly have. So what I've tried to collect for you here today is a bunch of tips that will help you avoid some mistakes when it comes to lumber and plywood. Wood moves even after milling. So after you pass this guy over the jointer and planer, you got a perfectly flat board. If you leave it by itself for a little while, you come back to it, you're gonna notice that it's not flat anymore. Now some boards certainly do this more than others, but it's definitely something to look out for. As a board gets milled down, it can release internal tension as well as cause uneven moisture loss, which results in a board that doesn't stay straight or flat for long. So how can we stack the cards in our favor? Buy good quality, well-dried material and try to give it time to acclimate in your shop. When milling, try to take an even amount off of each face and that should promote even moisture loss from both sides. Only mill the parts that you need immediately. If you won't get to that part of the project for another week, don't mill those parts today and let the pieces sit around. Try to incorporate your freshly milled stock into the project as soon as possible. If there will be a short delay between milling and usage, sticker and stack your materials after milling. Allowing all parts of the board to access fresh air should help keep them stable overnight or for a day or two. Now, if you milled a bunch of stock and don't plan to use it for an extended period of time, consider putting the boards in a plastic bag or even stretch wrapping them to slow down the moisture exchange with the air. Wood can move during a cut, and the longer and more narrow the board is, the more likely this is to happen. So let's say you've got a nice straight one by three and you wanna rip it in half, and you hope to get two straight pieces out of it, well, that's very unlikely to happen. You can see here, after the cut, these pieces are no longer straight. So what can you do? Cut your material just a little bit wide of the target, leaving yourself some room to joint the board again, and then come back to the table saw for the final cut. And yeah, it seems a little crazy to have to go back and forth to the jointer in a table saw like that, but if you want perfectly straight narrow boards, sometimes that's what you have to do. Thankfully, the wood doesn't always misbehave. If you make a few cuts out of a batch of material and it all seems to be pretty stable, a lot of times you don't have to go through that step, but sometimes you do. Solid wood expands and contracts with changes in humidity. Think of it like a sponge that shrinks when it's dry and expands when it's wet. Thankfully, this happens in a predictable manner, so you can use online calculators to determine just how much movement your material might experience and adjust your measurements accordingly to allow for that potential movement. Resist the temptation to cheap out on plywood. Plywood is actually one of those things where you tend to get what you pay for. The good stuff is expensive, and the cheap stuff is often not so great. How's that bow looking? Pretty nice, huh? Of course, there are always exceptions, but if you pay 30 bucks for a sheet of three quarter inch plywood, I hope your project is a skateboard ramp. Unfortunately, plywood doesn't always stay flat, and the cheaper it is, the more likely it is to warp after the purchase. Always remember, crap in, crap out. If the material you're looking at is badly warped, has really loose knots, bug holes, checks, if it's just got a bunch of problems, you're not really gonna be able to erase those problems unless you have a specific plan for stabilizing those features and making it part of your project. For instance, surface checking is often a sign of a deeper problem. Those checks tend to go pretty deep into the board and boards that start severely twisted sometimes return to their twisted state shortly after milling. And ripping a board through a knot will often cause the board to warp after the cut. It's a lot like my hair on picture day in high school. It started off straight in the morning, but by the afternoon, it looked like this. Now keep in mind, we're not talking about reclaimed stock or even really rough material. These often look like crap, but there's good material at the core. Buying thicker lumber and then resawing the boards you need out of it is always more expensive. And that's not the way I thought of it when I first started. I just thought if it is closer to its raw material, I should be able to save money but that's not the case. Now, here's an example. I've got an eight quarter board here and two four quarter boards, but they represent the same amount of board feet of material. So my four board foot boards here at 375 a board foot, it's $15 a board. So I can get both of these boards for 30 bucks. In this case, I've got my eight quarter material that's priced at 450 a board foot. So you do that math and it's $36. So with the eight quarter board, I could take that, resaw it, get my two boards out of it, do a whole lot of extra work to end up with the final product I want and pay 36 bucks, 
or I could just buy the two boards already split in the form that I need them and only pay $30. It's definitely counterintuitive, but this is the way the lumber industry works. Cutting thicker lumber means fewer sellable boards from each log. When you go thicker, you also have more potential for hitting major flaws that prevent the board from hitting a particular grade. Thicker boards also take longer to dry, and most importantly, three quarter inch thick boards generally sell faster than thicker stock. Always call around to check prices. Lumber prices can vary, not only from region to region, but store to store within the same city. I remember back in Arizona when I first tried to start my woodworking business there, I really struggled because I found a store that catered to woodworkers and their prices were just ridiculous and I didn't know how I was going to survive like that. Well, I talked to a few locals and found a local place that generally serves businesses and other pros and their prices were so much more reasonable, like on the order of 50% less and I was able to make a go of it with those lower prices, but in the same town, right? So woodworking stores generally are great for supplies and tools, may not always be the best choice when it comes to getting your materials. Finish will not forgive crappy wood. You know, a lot of times when you're just starting out, you get inexpensive materials because that's what you can afford or all you could find, and you're hoping that the finish will turn it into something that's durable that will last. Unfortunately, that generally just doesn't happen. In an effort to make the material more durable, you'll coat the hell out of it with polyurethane and just hope for the best. Unfortunately, most finishes can't make a wood what it ain't. If the wood underneath the finish isn't durable, the piece will likely still dent, scratch, and eventually fail. What gives furniture true durability is the wood itself. Finish can often enhance the durability, but polyurethane can't turn pine into hard maple. If and when the budget allows, try to pick a species of wood that gives you an appropriate amount of durability for the task at hand, and you could worry a lot less about the finish. Learn to paint with the grain as soon as possible. I remember when I first learned about this concept, I was really frustrated because it was like, man, I just learned how to make joinery and now you actually want me to pay attention to what the grain is doing and to make it look good next to other boards. But the sooner you do that, the better off your work will be. My dining chairs provide some good examples. Let's take a look at these crest rails. Each one kind of has its own personality. I tried to make the grain symmetrical when possible, but on my prototype here, I just used whatever I had on hand and you can see how different it looks when the grain isn't balanced. Take a look at the back slats. Instead of just picking random boards for these, I tried to cut them from the same board to help maintain grain continuity. A book match would have looked even nicer here. On my media credenza, you really can't miss the book matched panels on the doors. They look like owls or dragons, but the more subtle details are things like the door rails that were cut from the same board, the bottom rail that has a curved grain that matches the curved shape, and even these little feet which have grain that roughly follows the shape. Of course, some people prefer to embrace randomness in their work, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But paying careful attention to grain patterns, in my opinion, is next level artistry that really showcases a mastery of the medium, or in my case, attempts to master the medium. So when buying material, try to buy boards with grain that would look good as a particular part of the project. It is always worth the extra effort. So there you go. I hope that helps you avoid some mistakes that I've made in the past and makes your life a little bit easier going forward. And of course, you know, a lot of smart people out there. If you guys have tips on how we can avoid mistakes when it comes to lumber and plywood, please feel free to use the comment section to tell us all about it. And of course, like and subscribe the video if you enjoyed what we've done here. All right, thank you for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time. Those prices were incredibly reasonable, and some, you know, some, and I'm still learning about it. There's always a... back to the table saw for the final cut, just to make sure that my butt doesn't smell.